is a yoke and it's a burden. Everything. Living, living in poverty is a yoke and a burden. It's a yoke. And I'm not saying joke. <laughs> it's a yoke. And the devil, when, if he can get people into believing that this is God's will for my life, he can keep them in that yoke for as long as they live. Forever. And but but see that I always I always used to think, God, why on earth did he say that? I came to preach the gospel to the poor. What the heck does the gospel have to do for the poor? The poor need money. See, it's it's good to give money. It's good to sow into people's life. It's good to, to help people with financial needs. But that's not what they need. They need the anointing. Yes. Yes. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The same gospel that Jesus said that I've been sent to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set liberty those who are captives. The same gospel that Jesus came to preach is the same gospel that Paul said, I'm not ashamed of. Why? Why am I not ashamed of this gospel? Because it is the power. Say power. It's the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, it's the power that people need to live life. Salvation isn't just uh, accepting Jesus into your heart and going to heaven. That's a part of it. That's how it begins. But salvation is much more than just that. You see, we, we, we often think that, you know, oh, Jesus Jesus is all that I need. Jesus is enough for me. He's enough. No, he's not. Sorry to tell you, Jesus is not enough. He's more than enough. More than enough. And when we stop right there at, you know, I just need salvation and, and I, whatever happens on this life is all right. I just got going to heaven. You are going to live in bondage. You will. You will be a, a slaved free man. Because once you accept Christ, he says, you're free. You are free. But because even though you are, you are free spiritually, you are still in bondage here. You are still in bondage mentally and, and, and physically. If you have sickness in your body, that's bondage. It, re it restricts you from doing what you want to do. If you're poor, you can't do what you want to do. You can't go take your family on a trip. You can't bless your neighbor. You're in bondage. And the moment we realize that it's so much further than just salvation being just going to heaven someday. Salvation means to be saved here on earth. To be saved from the destruction of this earth. And if the devil can keep you with that mentality that what you're going through right now is God's will and oh well, he'll keep you there. You'll keep yourself there. In Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27, man, I'm running out of time. In Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27, the scripture says, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away. Say away. His burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of what? The anointing. The anointing is the burden lifting, yoke destroying power of God on the inside of you. Amen? Amen? Oh, man. You've got the anointing, church. And if, if, if poverty is a burden, 
What does the anointing get to do to that? It breaks it. It lifts it. Amen? Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. There's going to be people upset at this message today, but they'll get over it. Amen? Amen. This is for those who receive it today. This is for those who believe it today. Those who don't believe it, I'm sorry, but you're, you're out of luck, man. You're out of luck. You have no other hope. What are you going to hope in the world? The world has no hope for you. The only hope you have is in the gospel of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is what the word poverty means. It means uh, beggar, inadequate, insufficient, scarce, scant, and small. That's what the word poverty means. In other words, you can, the way poverty is mentioned in the Bible is the two words weakness and inability. That's what it, it, it's referring to whenever you see the word poverty in here. Weakness and inability. I've never read the Bible where it says, now God, who is able to make all grace abound, will make you inadequate, insufficient, scant in every good work. Have you? No. No. This is, this is what poverty is. It's to, 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 to be weak, to not do what you were supposed to do, to not do what you were called to do, to not, to not have the ability to do what it is God has called you to do. Now, here's what prosperity means. To advance, to be profitable, to success in reaching. To success in reaching you know what that means that means when you have a you have a reach advantage has anyone ever watched boxing before and they had the tail of the tape and this spider versus this spider and you see all their attributes and you have their weight their age their their record but then they have this one specific uh, statistic that says reach and one will be bigger than the other sometimes they'll be the same but usually, unless you're like Mike Tyson, usually who has the advantage? The one with the longer reach or the one with the shorter reach? Longer reach. Why? Because you can keep them at a distance. You, you, you have more room. You have more space. You have more ability to be protected from the other person. Now, if you're a talented fighter like Mike, you can get into that reach and knock them out with one punch. But usually the reach that the opponent has is the advantage. And for us, the reach, success in reaching, means that we will never get to a place where we're barely making ends meet. Me, why? Because we have a reach. We have, we have length to us. We have extra to us. Amen? Amen. It's a reach. Mm. Somebody say, I've got a reach. Thank you, Lord. Look at it in the Amplified Classic Version. It says, It shall be in that day that the burden of the Assyrian shall depart from your shoulders and his yoke from your neck. The yoke shall be destroyed because of the fatness, which prevents it from going around your neck. Man, see, some of y'all don't like fatness. Well, let me tell you, when you're fat, you prevent the yoke. Amen? Uh, don't, don't get too excited now. The yoke can't go around your neck because it's a fat neck. It can't do it. And that word, that fat word was the anointing. That's what it was called, the anointing. Look at it in the ISV version. It says, indeed, the yoke will be broken because you become obese. I'm not making this up. The yoke will break because you become obese. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating that we become obese now, all right? I'm not, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is how does fatness come about? I mean, I, I'm sure most of us have, have looked in the mirror and we're looking at certain body parts and we're going, where did that come from? And we don't know where it came from. It just appeared, Right? Well, how did it get there in the first place? 
because you kept eating. But it's increase. Am I wrong? Something increased. Something increased to cause the fatness. And in here, that's what it's referring to, this anointing. Because of the anointing, because of the fatness around the neck, the yoke can't stay because of the increase. Mm. So is it God's will for us to increase and overflow? The anointing that was on Jesus is the anointing that's on us. Mm. Look at the Young's literal translation. I like the literal translation because what it says, it's the literal translation of these words. It says, it'll come to pass in the day. Turned is his burden from thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and destroyed hath been the yoke because of what? Oh, man, we're dangerous territory now. (laughs) The yoke broke because of the prosperity, the increase, the anointing that's in our life. If I can have the band come up, I'm going to try to wrap this up. I have one one more story to tell you. Don't turn there. It's going to be on the screen. I'm just going to get through this. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Thank you, Lord. Have you guys ever heard the story of Samson? This isn't it. But the story of Samson, what was so great about Samson? He was strong. And I'm sure like, like, like me, most of you have the idea that, man, Samson was this ripped, buff, huge dude. Maybe he had dreadlocks on him. I don't know. But he was this chiseled, cut guy that could just tear down a whole army with the jaw of a donkey. Right? The Bible never talks about his stature. Never once talks about his physical appearance. Which tells me this guy wasn't strong physically. This guy wasn't yoked this guy wasn't big he was adequate he was he was small he was a little kid he he wasn't he wasn't like like me he was smaller he probably actually looked like me but what's the importance was he had this mighty strength about him not because of his muscles not because of his size What was it because of church? The anointing. The anointing. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 9 verse 1, it says this, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of uh, uh, Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of of Bekorath, the son of that person, uh, Benjamin, a mighty man of power. Next verse. It says, He had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul let me tell you this if the Bible says you were handsome you're handsome very handsome and he was this handsome handsome man says there was none more handsome than him among the children of Israel from his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people so here we got this man in the Bible I mean, he was an Israelite, so he was Jewish, so he was probably dark. Got this tall, dark, and handsome guy that God called handsome. He was every church girl's dream. <laughs> he had everything to offer physically. He looked, looked great. But then it says in, in, in verse 16, or going in between that, his father lost some of his animals and so Saul and his brothers they went out and they were looking for the animals and all of a sudden they couldn't find them and 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 they were getting worried and and they they found these girls and so Saul went and he talked to the girls and he asked them hey where where is this prophet that we've heard of who can tell us where my father's animals are at and so he's talking to the girls and the girls probably saw Saul and went (laughs) over there and so they went and they got they went to go talk to the prophet And the prophet was Samuel. The prophet Samuel. 
And so before Saul goes and meets Samuel, the day before, God told Samuel this. He said, tomorrow, in verse 16, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you will anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hands of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come upon me. See, the people of Israel, they wanted to anoint a king, appoint a king. And so Saul was, was the choice. God saw Saul and he, he picked him and he told Samuel, you're going to go anoint this guy. And so fast forward a day later, Saul's looking for his father's animals. And in, in verse 19, Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer that you're looking for. He says, go up before me to the high place. For you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go, and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for the donkeys that were lost three days ago, don't be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not you and all of your father's house? So this was a glimpse of from Saul understanding what was happening with him. Samuel was told by God to go anoint this Saul. Go anoint him because he's the king, the next king, the the first king of Israel. And so that's what he's saying. On on whom is all the desire of Israel? Talking about Saul. So Israel wants you as king. And this is his response in verse 21. He says, Saul answered, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? In other words, he's saying, who am I? Who am I to be the king? Aren't I from the smallest tribe? You see, Saul had everything looks wise. Tallest, handsomest, darkest, looked great. Amazing looking guy. But just because everything looks all polished on the outside doesn't mean things aren't going on in the inside. So he had insecurity. He had an insecurity about who he was because of where he came from. He had a broken soul. Or you could say he was broken hearted. What did the anointing of Jesus come to heal? The broken hearted. Hmm. Watch it now, because it's going to get good. In verse 27, the scripture says, As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel told Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead, and he went on. But you stay here, that I may announce to you the word of the Lord. Verse 10, or chapter 10, verse 1. This says this, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Mm. Verse six says, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. The transformation. Saul being insecure, not knowing why he was chosen. Aren't I just a Benjamite, the smallest of tribes? Why me? But the moment he got the anointing on him, see, we have these little, little tiny glasses of anointing oil. And it's in the back. That's not what this was. Back in the day, they used to anoint people from the top of their head and they would just lather it on them it would cover their entire body head to toe it was thick it was heavy it was a sense of something new being put on you and that's what happened the, the word anointing literally means to smear over and so he got, became anointed by the word of the lord and was turned into another Man, See, the anointing of God is the equipment to do the job, but it's not just that. It's also the power to be who God created you to be. It's the power to be what God said you could be, who God said you could be. 
If God told you to rise up and start a business, but you don't know how or if you can, the anointing that God has on you is more than enough to start that business and grow it to be more than you ever thought it could be. That's the anointing. The anointing of God can take a, a, a introverted person and make them a global minister preaching to billions of people. That's the anointing of God. It's the equipment to do what God called you to do, but it's the power to be who God called you to be. Amen? In verse 9, he says, So it was when he had turned his back to go from Samuel that God gave him another heart. All those signs came to pass that day. When he, they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. And the Spirit of God came on him. And he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly, what does that mean? They knew him before. Before what? The anointing. They knew Saul before he was anointed. They saw him and they said, they, they, he prophesied among them and they said to each other, what is this that's come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? See, something happened to Saul and it caused a difference in his life. When the Lord comes upon you, there needs to be a difference. People have to look at you and go, there's something different about who you are. And what is that? It's the anointing. It's the anointing to be who God called you to be. Saul got changed into a completely different man. Completely different. Why don't we stand as I, I share one more scripture with you. Thank you, Lord. It's in Philippians. If you want to turn there, you can. It'll be on the screen. Before I get to that one, I want to talk to you about one more great spiritual man of God. His name was Popeye the Sailor Man. Ever heard of him? <laughs> Anyone ever watch Popeye the Sailor Man? I used to watch him all the time when I was a kid. What was the whole deal about him? He loved this girl, olive oil, a certain type of anointing oil. <clears throat> and he loved her. But there was this guy in, in their life. What was his name? Brutus? Brutus. Brutus. And he was this big guy, big jerk, meanie. And so every single episode, man, it's funny how they used to be able to do the same exact thing every episode and still get away with it. Now we need something new all the time. But every single episode, Popeye and Olive Oil would, would either go on a date or get ready to go on a date or hang out and do something. And all of a sudden, here comes good old Brutus. And what does Brutus do? Like any person who loves a woman, he would take her and he would tie her up and put her on the robo tracks. <laughs> you know, like anyone does, right? When you try to impress someone. And so he, every single time leading up to that, Brutus would would just pulverize Popeye. He'd beat him up, he'd throw him against the wall, shove him in the ground. Every single episode, it's like, Popeye, how do you not know it's coming by now? Every time. And he gets, he gets beat up, and while Olive Oil is crying for help, and Brutus is over there watching her cry for help, what does Popeye do? He, he reaches into his pocket, as we all do, to grab a can of spinach, as we all carry. And he pulls out that can of spinach and he squeezes it open and it whoop, jumps in the air and falls into his mouth perfectly, not even spilling. And once that spinach gets on the inside of him, oh, you missed it. Once that spinach got on the inside of him, he changed into a completely different man where he got all of his strength and he went and he pounded Brutus and he saved olive oil. He changed when the anointing of God gets on you it changes you to be who God calls you to be amen oh thank you Lord thank you Lord I'll leave you with this last one Paul says in Philippians I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that how at last you care for me 
and, you, and it's flourished again. Verse 10, put it up on the screen. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Someone say abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both abounding and to suffer need. We'll stop right there. He says, I've learned how to abound and how to need. I've learned it. See, Paul, he has a secret to doing life. He had a secret to doing this. Do you know what the secret was? He knows how. That was his secret. He knows how. Matthew, what the heck are you talking about? Know how is valuable. Man, if you don't know how to fix your car, but someone knows how to fix your car, you're willing to pay a pretty penny for the one who knows how to fix the car. Know how is valuable. Paul, he said, I know how. He had the know how. What was the secret? He said, I know how to be content. I know how to abound. I know how to be abased. Everything I've learned how to be full and hungry, to abound and suffer need. Here's the secret. Verse 13. I, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret, church. What does Christ mean? The anointed one. I can do all things through the anointing that strengthens me. It's not in your power. It's not in your ability. It's not in your smarts. It's not in your wit. It's in the anointing that's on your life that enables you to do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. It's the anointing, church. Someone say, I've got the anointing. I've got the anointing. You don't need more money. You need to understand I've got the anointing. I've got the anointing to prosper. I've got the anointing, the burden lifting, yoke destroying anointing of God on my life. And if poverty is a burden, be gone in Jesus name. Thank you, Lord. If you believe all that this morning, somebody say amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Thank you, Lord.